Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Leila Ben Ali. My name is Leila Ben Ali. I'm Chief Economist and Head of Strategy at Apicorp, the Arab Petroleum Investment Corporation. And I would like to welcome you all for, uh, to this webinar, with this webinar organized by Apicorp. Uh, for those of you who still do not know us, although you, you are present today, I think we have a, a, a large uh, turnout. Uh, Apicorp is a financial institution supporting the Arab energy industry. And over the last four decades, Epicorp has worked to raise capital access and enhance the financial stability and performance of the energy industry through an array of strategic equity investments, project loans, trade finance, advisory and research. And one of our flagship research products is uh, indeed our energy investments outlook that you are now, I think, mostly most familiar with since you are attending this webinar. Uh, and our energy investments outlook is typically focusing on the MENA region, even if we capture some of the major uh, wider uh, global energy trends that are relevant for the MENA region. And uh, the report that we are discussing today is focusing on the gas and petrochemical sectors over the next five years. And it is part of our, in, of our investment outlook series, and we, we launched it earlier this week. And in order to do so, in order to discuss uh, the, the major trends in these two important sectors for the region, I invited two authorities in uh, the gas and petrochemical sectors who have also been kind enough to peer review the report when we were finalizing it. So Anne-Sophie Corbeau is uh, head of analysis at BP. Uh, she has been working in the energy industry for almost more than 20 years uh, with a particular focus on the gas industry. And she's the author of many publications and books focusing on gas and LNG markets and of course emerging markets as well. And before joining BP, uh, Apico, uh, before joining BP, she was a research fellow at Kapsar, the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies uh, and Research Center in Riyadh. Uh, before that, she was responsible for managing the research on global gas markets at the, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, and IHS SERA, Cambridge Energy Research Associates. And Anne-Sophie and I started at SERA roughly around the same time. And one thing that I remember uh, from her is that she was actively researching and she was even maintaining a blog on fuel cells and hydrogen. So Anne-Sophie, I can tell you that you have an advance of uh, 20 years advance. Uh, Dr. Mustafa Uki uh, is, uh, has a 30 years experience in developing, executing, and managing, sorry, and managing uh, uh, gas and energy related techno economic projects throughout the world. Uh, Dr. Uki uh, worked closely with uh, governments and private sector decision makers in a number of countries on the formulation, funding, implementation of energy infrastructure projects and policies. I knew him when he was advising uh, the development of uh, energy and infrastructure projects, including gas to power projects, gas-based petrochemical projects, and cross-border gas pipelines uh, and LNG projects. He was also involved in, uh, he's also, also currently involved in work sponsored by international organizations on energy for sustainable development. Uh, Dr. Uki started his career with uh, career with uh, Algeria's national oil company, Sonatrach, and worked in uh, Washington, D.C. on gas development projects for the World Bank. He was vice president in Nexum's Energy and Chemicals Advisory Division, uh, based in London. And prior to Nexum, he was with Bechtel and Tenspan. So really, I could not think of uh, better of a better uh, duo to dissect, to dissect the, the changing dynamics of the gas and petrochemical sectors in the region. And to kick off the discussion, I will start with five slides reflecting some of the key messages from the report. And then I will let Anne-Sophie and uh, Mustafa uh, to share with us their own reading of the outlook before, of course, we open the floor for the Q and A's and, and, and discussion. So without further ado, if you were familiar with some of the uh, research that we have been posting on uh, uh, the crisis, 
uh, I think you are familiar with the, some of the concepts that we have been using to describe the 2020 crisis. And I think since March uh, in April, uh, we started communicating on the fact that this is a triple crisis that has been affecting this region, uh, particularly uh, on, a, on a double uh, course. Uh, it has been a health pandemic, of course, but also uh, a commodities and oil crisis and uh, followed by potentially a financial crisis that might be affecting some emerging markets, including in this region. Um, and the reason for that is because we wanted to track the impact on energy demand and supplies and of course, uh, investments. Uh, and we have been following some of the key metrics that have deteriorated all at the same time. This is a crisis where we've seen the highest synchronization ever with the deterioration of multiple metrics, metrics at the same time. We have been following very closely the government policies in terms of lockdowns. And we've said, I, I would say pretty early on that we believed uh, that they, the governments will be implementing flexible and reversible policies because of the unbearable dilemma of saving lives versus saving the economies. Uh, so we have been assuming uh, quite early on that this will be leading to a W-shaped recovery for most of the markets that are relevant for the webinar that we have today. And I think the second key message there is that we have been scrutinizing the global, re the global reset that is happening in the energy sector with potential winners that might be emerging or re-emerging in, in, in the sector. And you will see in, in this discussion today, uh, some of the winners that, uh, that might be re-emerging in the new, in the post-COVID world. Um, so I think you are now quite familiar with some of the, uh, the, the demand trends that have been revised many times over the course of this year. As far as gas is concerned, there is no secret. It was the same uh, shock that has affected most commodities. Uh, today, we are assuming uh, a 3% reduction year on year in 2020. It was revised uh, recently from the 4%. It's a, a better uh, a reduction, but at the same time, it's still a, a deeper reduction than uh, the 2% that we've witnessed in the 2008-2009 crisis as far as gas demand is concerned. Um, what interests us is also, I think, the medium term impact that the current crisis, because it's deep and long lasting, has on gas demand trends. And I'm sure Anne Sophie will pick up on some of those uh, aspects, uh, uh, given, her, given the nature of, of her global portfolio. Uh, I think the 2020 global crisis now is really expected to reduce the annual growth rate for global gas demand. Uh, for the for the period period that interests us, the next five years, uh, to 1.5 percent, compared to the earlier estimates pre-COVID of 1.8 percent, the market is already accounting for the risk of prolonged overcapacity in LNG uh, because of the buildup in, in in new export capacity really outpaces uh, lower than expected demand growth. So for us, from our perspective we still think we are working with the assumption that Harry Hub will continue to be uh, in, in the lower uh, threes, less than three to four dollars per million BTU up to uh, 2020, 2023 at least. And the prices at the other hubs will not exceed four to five to six dollars between now and 2023. This is very much dependent on many factors, including uh, how, whether uh, the major markets of, of China and potentially India uh, will pick up as far as the global LNG demand is concerned. Uh, the other uh, aspect that we've noticed is the market has been, uh, the, the sector has been affected by supply chain issues, by payment issues, especially in the early part of the pandemic where uh, the gas sector has been affected by uh, Asian shipyards being closed or uh, uh, research centers being uh, being closed in some parts of the world that have been affected first in Italy, in Asia. So we are still assuming that some, some projects, especially the planned projects, will be closely screen-sized, questioned, or potentially postponed. And by 2030, I think there is a, another uh, important insight, but 
is not, this is nothing new in there, that the petrochemical sector will be the main driver for oil demand. And that, that has been a trend that has been identified over the last two or three years pre-pandemic. And we think that COVID-19 is underscoring this trend of the petrochemical sector being a driver for oil demand. Um, if, if we focus on the MENA region for a moment, I think we are seeing some more, over, more or less the same trends uh, globally as far as the demand is concerned. Uh, demand is, is expected to slow down in terms of growth to roughly 4% uh, this year compared to the 6% that we had last year. And the da this downward revision is mainly due to, of course, a slower GDP growth rate, uh, a slower industrial output. And mind you, the industrial sector is becoming, in the MENA region, a major driver of gas demand. And of course, uh, it happened at the same time as countries were reforming uh, their gas prices domestically and were introducing uh, nuclear plants in the UAE, nuclear power plants, in the UAE and renewables in other parts of, in other parts of the region. Uh, so the good news from our side is that committed gas investments uh, held steady uh, in, uh, in the next five years, whereas planned investments increased. And this is, if you compare that to the other uh, sectors in this region, uh, the gas sector is, the gas and petrochemical sector is the one that has been, uh, that where we see planned investments continuing to uh, increase in the future. And that because of the continuation and the concentration of, of uh, uh, the, the strategies of several countries to have gas to power projects and plans, improved monetization of gas as a fuel, particularly to the industrial sector. And I think very, very importantly for few countries, including Qatar, uh, strategic market share positioning in the future. So you, we are assuming that some planned investments, some major planned investments will be confirmed uh, in the future. As far as uh, petrochemical projects are concerned, uh, we don't see a major change simply because there has been a completion of several projects in 2019. So the small decrease that you see in, 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 the, in the committed projects in, as far as uh, petrochemical projects are concerned is just a matter of uh, completion of, of projects in 2019. Um, Saudi Arabia, as far uh, as countries are concerned, Saudi Arabia, Iran and Iraq are the top three countries in terms of committed gas investments. But if you look at the planned investments, it's really supported by Qatar, North Field Expansion and the UAE Gas Development Master Plan, which are accounting for 20 to $22 billion each of total planned gas investments. On the petrochemical side, you have Egypt, Iran, and Saudi Arabia uh, uh, being the top three in terms of committed investments. Uh, and that's, this is mainly driven by the localization of specialty chemical industries uh, and feedstock import substitution. But we're really seeing uh, uh, an issue with potentially prolonged depression of LNG prices that will put additional pressure on a few exporters in the MENA region. Uh, again, uh, this, uh, we are not taking for granted a prolonged dep depression of LNG prices because we believe that uh, the, the market is cyclical and there will be ma some market correction at some point. But the oversupply that we are seeing in the LNG market is quite uh, uh, alarming for some of the uh, exporters that are having, as you can see in the next slide, um, negative uh, export net back parity for their uh, gas pipeline or LNG. And this is something new that we have introduced also this year in, in our gas and petrochemical outlook is uh, it, it is, this is not meant to be a marketing tool for gas exporters. It is really meant for us to understand which countries are less or better positioned than others of, in their gas monetization program and their strategic decisions between uh, exporting their gas or uh, keeping it domestically for, uh, for domestic reasons, for domestic consumption, sorry. So this is uh, a, a new feature that we have uh, in introduced this year. Uh, the, the rationale is very simple. We look at uh, a, a wide range of, of, of upstream costs in specific countries in the region. We include uh, in the calculation uh, averages or assumptions on liquefaction uh, costs, shipping costs, and uh, uh, regasification costs uh, in the main market, in the main destination market, to enable us to calculate 
uh, an export net back parity at uh, the export uh, gate of, of the country. So from that, ex that, that perspective, it, it shows that for countries like Egypt or Algeria, depressed LNG or depressed gas prices, prolonged depressed gas prices will put additional strain on, on, on their uh, export strategy in the future. And another thing that we track, and uh, you are possibly very familiar with, with that, is the role of the private sector. And it's true that when compared to last year, and again, another thing that we added this year is the petrochemical sector. So it's quite difficult to compare apples to apples, but we can see that the share of, of government investments in gas projects have slightly uh, uh, increased this year uh, compared to last year. And the same thing when it comes to petrochemicals. And the reason for that is quite simple, is because we are seeing a consolidation of, of, of projects as much as possible, and, and projects are increasing in size, particularly in the pet petrochemical sector. However, because of the potential uh, addition of new funding trends that we are seeing in the region, and you can see in the report the fact that uh, countries are, are trying to monetize their domestic uh, assets in pipelines, uh, in, in joint ventures, etc., we might actually in, see in the future an increase, uh, potential increase of the private sector in the gas and petrochemical sector. But this year, compared to last year, we've seen we've seen a small decrease. And when I talk about consolidation, I think one example that we have, if if you take the uh, the example of of Saudi Arabia, today you have 13 petrochemical companies that are listed in a Tadawal uh, stock exchange uh, in Riyadh. Um, uh, Sabic, Yansab, Safco, and Kayan are already now uh, part of, of, of Saudi Ramco. And we, we know that uh, some other medium-sized players or even niche players are looking into uh, potential uh, merging and, and, and mergers and acquisition possibilities. So this is uh, a potential uh, change, uh, uh, additional consolidation in, in a, in a fra relatively fragmented uh, petrochemicals market in, in the region. So with that, I would like to uh, conclude with uh, some of the uh, winning strategies that, if you may, that we see in the, in, the, in the future and why we believe that some winners might be emerging in, in the MENA region. Uh, the, one of the things that we look at as investors is uh, when it comes to uh, oil and gas investments is whether you have capital efficiency. Uh, as far as gas is concerned, whether you have supply chain uh, um, optimization, uh, the downstream market development is definitely a, a major issue here. Uh, low cost, low carbon assets, access to low cost, low carbon assets are definitely uh, an important driver. And of course, this digitalization and advanced analytics is quite is key, very important. So among these five factors, we believe that many players in this region are having at least four uh, of those factors. The main thing that will make a difference is indeed uh, access to an opening new markets, particularly when it comes to uh, gas and petrochemicals. So the marketing uh, uh, tools or, or arms of, of, the, of, of the main players will, will be quite key. So with that, I would like to conclude uh, this presentation and give the floor now to Anne-Sophie and, and Mustafa to tell us uh, what they thought uh, were the key surprises and uh, share with us some of the counterintuitive insights uh, that they would like to hi highlight from our investment outlook when they were uh, reviewing it. So uh, I'll probably start with, with Mustafa on this one, and, and then we'll give the floor to Anne-Sophie. All right. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the kind invitation. It's, um, what is interesting, I believe it's the, your last slide, is the high level of government commitment in terms of uh, committed uh, gas uh, uh, project. I think if I remember well, the, the figure is 96% of government uh, funding of uh, this gas project. Uh, now this is, again, this is quite interesting at the moment where IOCs are slashing their capital expenditure and even some NOCs have uh, significantly uh, decreased uh, their uh, capital expenditures. And if we can call it this kind of counter cyclical uh, funding of gas project is quite interesting. And it 
it reflects, as you rightly said, uh, Leila, that uh, the gas to power project and the need uh, for further uh, domestic monetization. But we are in a, in a different period. I believe that this is going to be followed by reforms or further reforms of the energy sector, because all this government funding uh, will have to come from somewhere and the situation, the existing situation cannot continue as business as usual. So. What is interesting is the continued uh, commitment of government in terms of uh, funding a uh, gas project, but we should expect some kind of reforms. In fact, you know, reforms have already taken place in a number of MENA countries. So we will see more or further reform of the energy sector. That's my take on this for that. Thank you, Mustafa. And Sophie, what was the most uh, I think there were, there were two things. I mean, the first one was uh, the continued growth of uh, gas demand in MENA region in 2020. I mean, uh, I, I had actually to check uh, back our uh, BP statistical review and I realized, yeah, it's true actually. I mean, gas demand over the past 20 years has never dropped, even in the period 2008 to 2010 when we had the previous crisis. I mean, gas demand didn't drop, which is very interesting in itself. So, I mean, the continuous strength uh, of, of the gas demand, even at obviously at individual country levels, you know, there can be up and downs, but globally the region continues to see its gas demand growing, which is very interesting and leads basically to, to the second point about you, know, exactly as Mustafa said, uh, the strength of uh, commitments in gas projects. At the time, uh, you, when you look at the IEA uh, investment outlook, I mean, they pointed at a, a slash of upstream investment in 2020 by one third compared to 2019 levels. And I know we are not comparing exactly the same thing I mean, it's upstream oil and gas, and you are looking at all gas projects. But you see that, you know, I mean, there is a global trend, which is due to this absolutely perfect storm uh, in terms of prices, in terms of demand, compared to what we see happening in this region. And I understand, obviously, there are some specific cases. I mean, uh, you are looking at gas to power projects. There are also some LNG liquefaction plans in Qatar, which are quite advanced. So this is completely different from the rest of the world. But still, it feels that, you know, the, the Middle East or the MENA region is a little bit on a different path compared to the world. Um, to come back to probably 2020, I would like to remind people that when we started the year 2020, even before COVID-19, we knew it would be oversupplied. I mean, it, it has just been completely exacerbated. We didn't expect demand to fall. And, and I mean, 3% is not that bad. I have to say, I mean, gas demand has been relatively resilient compared to other fuels overall. Uh, and, and if we have a cold winter, it's going to be probably a bit less than that. Um, and, and, and we knew it would be particularly tense on the global LNG market with a key question at the beginning of the year, will there be any US LNG shut-ins or not? And the answer has been an absolutely outstanding Yes, there have been. And I, I, I think the amount of US LNG shut-in has been way much higher than anybody expected. I do remember uh, talking to uh, somebody from Chenier, I'm not going to quote him, saying, um, you know, how exactly do you do US LNG shut-ins? I mean, do you shut down one plant after the other? I mean, technically, I still don't know what exactly was the answer, but the thing is, US LNG has been basically the adjustment variable in the global LNG market. It has not been the only one. I mean, there have been some reduction of LNG exports globally. There have been also reductions in domestic gas production when people figure out, oh, well, actually LNG is cheaper than my domestic gas production, so I'm going to take advantage of that. There have been also reduction in terms of pipeline exports, in particular, I mean, North African gas to Europe, Russian gas to Europe. And there has been also a lot of coal to gas switching, in particular in Europe, but also if you are looking at it also in the United States, the only region where we have not seen that happening massively is Asia, which is a critical region in terms of coal to gas, because in that region, gas prices are still massively linked to oil prices. So we have not seen, you know, these prices at $2 per MMBTU, so the JKM price is not totally representative of the import prices in China, Korea, and Japan, which are really key countries for LNG. 
Yeah, thank, thanks, Anne Sophie. So, a story of uh, strength and resilience uh, overall, overall story of strength and resilience. Um, I, I was, this leads me actually to my, um, to my second question that I wanted to ask you, uh, starting with you, Anne Sophie, is you remember, I mean, over the last 10 years or so, there has always been this debate of whether gas finally ends up being a destination fuel or be, or is it a bridging fuel, etc. Um, but given all the bullish and bearish factors that, that you have described here, um, and the US LNG becoming one of, one of the adjustment variables, not the only one, but definitely a key one, uh, what is for you the future outlook for, for gas markets and prices? Uh, your personal, I would say, outlook, given the ac accelerated drive for energy transition? I mean, would we solve that dilemma for, for the gas sector once and for all? I mean, since I am a BP person, I would like to point out that we have released about a month ago our BP outlook, which is looking at 2050. So I understand 2050 may look very far, but I mean, you know, we are already talking about net zero. BP is talking about a net zero company, but by 2050 or even before. And I think this is a general trend. So it was worth looking at, I mean, what would be the implications for the different fuels? What would be, you know, the key trends and what a net zero world could look like? And, and we have different scenarios, obviously, with different pathways for natural gas. And one of the things which comes out is that uh, natural gas or gas in general, if we had biomethane, it is more resilient than ever oil or coal. So if you are looking, for example, at, the, at a rapid scenario, which achieves by 2050 a reduction of uh, CO2 emissions coming from the energy sector by about 70% compared to 2018 levels, gas demand by 2050 is at about the same level as gas demand in 2018. Oil is at 50 million barrels per day. So that gives you a kind of different outlook. And why is gas more resilient? Because of two things, essentially. The first one is if you want to basically be on the path to net zero, there is one absolutely imperative thing to do. It's decarbonizing Asia. I mean, Asia, if you're looking at China plus India, plus uh, over developing Asia, this is about 15 gigaton of CO2 emissions coming from the energy sector. So, and, and about 10 gigaton is coming from coal. So decarbonizing industry and power in that region is absolutely imperative. And gas has potentially a role to play there. Because, I mean, no matter how fast renewables are going to grow in any scenario, I mean, they cannot meet, you know, the increase in energy demand because we are not going to ask these countries to just stop growing. I mean, you know, they're... Uh, consumption per capita is much lower than in Europe or in the US. So they, they cannot be asked to stop growing. But if they switch from coal to gas, the answer in most countries, except maybe China, is going to be LNG. So, I mean, and, and, and it's going to be also, I mean, additional uh, gas demand. So we see gas demand, therefore, in the rapid scenario growing up to 2035 and then coming down because of the decline in the developed world, because of energy efficiency, because of the growth of renewable, and because also of an increase in CO2 prices. But this is absolutely essential. And the second thing which is absolutely essential is CCUS. I mean, you need CCUS in order to decarbonize gas in power in industry and also in order to produce blue hydrogen. So this is steam methane reforming and CCUS. You, you need to have something which is decarbonized. And this is absolutely fundamental for gas to play a role in the long term. This dual role, supporting the shift from coal to gas and being decarbonized as much as possible are two absolutely fundamental criteria. Indeed, and for our audience, I will remind them, I mean, 50 million barrels a day, that's half of today's oil market. And uh, gas demand at 2018 level that, that tells you how the resilience of the two fuels of, of gas versus oil will, will, will play out. Um, Mustafa, do you have uh, some thoughts on that as well? Yes, I mean, it's the same, uh, same kind of uh, development uh, that should be envisaged. Uh, we have seen a lot of energy outlook uh, being issued recently, including uh, the IEA's. Uh, World Energy Outlook uh, two days ago, I believe. And they all share a common feature, uncertainties. 
yes, if you look at the history of our industry, uncertainty has been a main feature. And as Anne Sophie was saying, I think the change, uh, what I would say, the structural uh, change that we're seeing now, it's this issue of uh, energy transition and climate change. And these are becoming the major driver. Uh, the question of um, whether gas is a destination fuel, I would like to use uh, the terminology used by gas advocacy groups, uh, the fact that uh, gas is part of the solution. I agree. But we have to go beyond this um, statement. I would say well beyond uh, this statement. Uh, the gas industry and all the stakeholders in the gas industries have to rethink change the way gas is produced, treated, transformed, uh, and transported, and even, uh, I mean, if you go as, as, as much as uh, regasification. So it's no longer business as usual. We tend to say that every year, but now I see a fundamental structural change, although it could be the same, in, in, in the way uh, the gas business is going to uh, evolve. Yes, resilient, but under a different uh, uh, climate. I would like to focus a little bit uh, more on, on the MENA region and uh, more specifically um, uh, North Africa. I was looking at uh, the IEA uh, numbers on uh, methane emission. Uh, I think Algeria, Egypt, Libya and Egypt uh, in 2019 accounted for about 12% of the oil of the total, that is the global oil and gas emission, and in terms of flaring, 10%. Now, this is a critical situation when you think about uh, uh, the fact that uh, the North African gas producers are also North African gas exporters, and the natural market is Europe. Uh, yesterday, the EU uh, issued its methane emission strategy, and they made it very clear, although it's in more diplomatic uh, terms, but it's clear that this kind of situation is not sustainable and change will have to come. How will that come? I mean, the EU talks about uh, partnership, but, but it is a critical situation for uh, exporters uh, in, in, in North Africa. So yes, gas is resilient. Yes, gas, I mean, I see that gas is, is gonna continue to be part of the equation, but the way this gas is produced, transported, et cetera, will have to change. Uh, otherwise, you know, you're gonna be in a very, very challenging uh, situation. Um, in terms of market size, I suppose Anne Sophia has mentioned, you know, uh, uh, the outlook, I mean, these are scenarios, but to me, the major change is how this gas is gonna be treated, especially by importing countries. In Asia, it could be different, but if we focus on North Africa specifically, it's going to be challenging for gas exporter. But you could ask yourselves, do they want to continue on the gas export route? That's a different debate. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Mustafa. I, I think the, the last question is something we debated many times, Mustafa and myself, uh, I think over the last, especially over the last couple of years. Uh, it's related to the petrochemical strategies of MENA countries. And I see in the chat, there are so many questions about petrochemicals and we'll try to tackle some of those actually while we are answering this question. So for example, how will the petchem supply in the Middle East compared to China in the next five years? Um, I would like Mustafa to tell us, I would like you to tell us if you have any concerns, if you see any opportunities regarding the petrochemical strategies in this, in this region, uh, Middle East and North Africa as a whole, I mean, uh, let's let's try to put the Middle East in a bucket and North Africa in a bucket. If you don't I mind. agree. Uh, concerns, no. But uh, I would like to say that I'm a bit intrigued by the high level of uh, what are the numbers of the high level of planned petrochemical project. Uh, I think it looks like maybe over eighty percent uh, of this uh, planned and committed. Uh, Project. Let me just make sure that I, I, I got it right a little. Yeah, uh, over 80% of the projects are in the planned project category. I hope I'm, I'm right. And 
again, if my, my calculations are correct, and what I've seen, we're talking about $100 billion of planned project over a period of five years. Now, if we look at the pattern of funding for the, for the committed uh, petrochemical project, we see that it's completely different than gas project. About 50% is financed by the private sector. If we make the same assumption, and, and this is in theoretical terms, it would mean that the private sector will have to fund 50% of this planned project. Uh, and to me, this is you know, quite a challenging situation. And is it you know, a reasonable assumption uh, to make, uh, especially in this uh, period of very subdued uh, uh, funding uh, requirement? In terms of strategy, uh, it's pretty obvious, and I think it's mentioned in, in the outlook, the strategy which is followed is to add value, to add, or what I would say, you know, try to capture more value down the chain uh, value of petrochemicals. And this is compared to what used to be done in the past when you have a petrochemical project exporting bulk chemicals, methanol, fertilizers. As, um, as one uh, representative of a large oil and gas producers in the MENA region used to say, uh, uh, we won't be allocating uh, any more gas because to us, this is another way to export cheap subsidized gas price. And I think they're right in terms of, you know, the idea of uh, adding value. And in fact, when you look at um, uh, the Gulf, uh, this uh, strategy of adding value down the value chain, it's not something new. They've been looking at it. Uh, I would say I mean, the Gulf petrochemical, the large uh, Gulf petrochemical producer, I've been looking at that for over 15 years. And uh, there was a concept of clusters. In fact, you know, if you look at uh, Saudi Arabia, Sadara is an example of clusters. Sator is an example of, you know, a refinery and integration with petrochemical. So this is not, um, uh, uh, this is not uh, nothing, some, nothing new. But I would like to come back to the, the, the huge uh, figure of $100 billion or $20 billion per year. And the question is, is there appetite or is it commercially justified uh, to have that kind of uh, planned level. Now, I have to be very careful because MENA is not a homogeneous region. Some MENA producers and established petrochemical uh, producers who have, you know, uh, existing uh, or established uh, petrochemical infrastructure, uh, I mean, that would be different, but that does not apply to all the MENA region, uh, MENA countries. And I would say it applies only to a very limited number of, uh, of, of, of countries. So yes, you know, it's interesting, but one has to look at this plan, the thing, and I would think it would be challenging to even, you know, maybe 60% of this project, you know, to be executed. Yeah, and I think actually it's one of the questions in the chat about uh, the probabilities of on the, 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 the planned projects that we have and that we list in our report in our database and whether they are uh, very much speculative yet and uh, whether we can assign a probability factor as per our understanding. I think uh, from our perspective, I would not assign a, a number, a probability number on, on any project. Uh, but I think from, from, um, from the fact, I mean, the way we define planned projects versus committed is all those projects that are in planning phase, feed, study, etc. The moment they reach uh, FID, uh, we, we put them into, uh, into committed because you actually have uh, investments being committed and financing being, being committed to these projects. So that I think, I hope that will clarify a little bit how, how we classify the projects. And it's true, we have our own understanding of, um, let's say, the, the qualitative probability of, of some projects that uh, be, could happen or not. But at the same time, I think one of the key issues that we look at is the competitiveness. And uh, I think one of the, another question in the chat was uh, the competitiveness of uh, Chinese petrochemicals versus uh, uh, Middle Eastern petrochemicals. And I think beyond the pricing dynamics that uh, Mustafa and Ansofi have uh, very uh, brilliantly described, uh, 
uh, I think from, from our perspective, uh, the, the MENA region really, really had to uh, define its, its, their, uh, the, its strategy going forward. It's true that, for example, if you take a, a scheme like crude to, crude to chemicals, it's definitely an area where you could see potentially fierce competi competition in the future uh, between uh, Asia in general and, and the Middle East if they are all embarking in the same scheme. Assuming again that uh, crude to chemical schemes in the, in the MENA region uh, continue as planned. For now, we are putting them in our plan projects. Um, but again, it's our understanding of, uh, of the, I would say, a relatively, a relatively uh, more than 30% probability, let's say, of, of these projects happening. But as long as they are in planning phase, uh, we, include in, we, we include them in our outlook. Um, Mustafa, did you want to add something? I saw you raising yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, the question of uh, comparing uh, Middle Eastern petrochemical export and Chinese uh, chemical export, I don't have numbers for that. But what I would like to say first, uh, most of the, the output, uh, petrochemical output uh, in the Middle Eastern region are exported. And Asia is one of uh, the targeting uh, export areas. And also uh, a couple of uh, Middle Eastern uh, petrochemical uh, producers have invested in Asia. So I think the comparison is not mid uh, Middle Eastern versus Chinese export is, you know, the demand and whether there is a market for that. You know, if you look at petrochemical industry, which is a cyclical or maybe even very cyclical industry where one world scale uh, petrochemical plant could frustrate uh, the economics of uh, the next uh, or the competing petrochemical project uh, queuing in the pipeline. So uh, it's, 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 it's a bit different. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm looking at the questions in parallel. And Sophie, feel free to jump in if there are, there are a couple of questions related to uh, BP, if you want to answer them uh, yourself. Uh, I don't think I'm seeing the question related to BP. So. <laughs> It's there, it's there, but uh, I can't um, Maybe for um, you. I, I will answer one question related to the time, by the time oil is completely used, the world will have developed sufficient alternative and sustainable energy. What happens when natural gas is completely depleted? Will we have alternative feedstock to the petrochemical industry? I mean, my simple answer to that is, uh, there, <laughs> there was a, a minister who said once, the age, stone age did not end because of the uh, end of stone in stones. Uh, and I think we, we are more or less uh, looking into the same sort of issues. I think there's an abundance of resources and kerogen, uh, which is the, the very first res uh, resource that uh, enables you to, to create oil and gas is I think abundant enough on the planet. That, that's not the issue. The, the issue is really how, to, uh, how you ensure that uh, you have the clear price signals. And this reminds me that we didn't talk about carbon pricing. Uh, the, the, the real price signals to enable a competition between different fuels at a play level, play, uh, level playing field, including as, as feedstock for the petrochemical industry, assuming that uh, the, the plastics recycling drive is not going to wipe out uh, any, uh, any future market for, for petrochemical. Uh, but uh, Mustafa and Sophie, feel free to jump in there. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, I mean, uh, I, I think in terms of carbon prices, I mean, uh, so in our scenarios, uh, we have, you know, the business as usual, where not much is happening in terms of uh, carbon emission reduction. I mean, by 2050, we are only at minus 10%. And this is also because carbon prices are not particularly high. But in both the scenarios, which are consistent with the IPCC, uh, either well below two degrees or uh, 1.5 degrees, I mean, we do have a very rapid and, and strong increase in carbon prices, which are reaching about $250 per ton, yeah, real, uh, by 2050 in developed world. And, and this is not the highest I have seen if you compare, I mean, you know, I, I see Mustafa is like, you know, <laughs> moving his head, but I mean, this is not the highest uh, we, we have seen, you know, in, in all the different scenarios. Uh, and, and at 150, uh, 75 in emerging economies. Uh, and this is for, for several reasons. I mean, you know, first of all, uh, you need to incentivize incentivize uh, new technologies, you need to incentivize CCUS, you need also to incentivize renewable. And as I mentioned before, 
So, I mean, you want to uh, make uh, new technologies, renewable, maybe gas as well, more competitive against coal in order to decarbonize the energy system. But in order for renewable, so new built renewable to be competitive against coal or maybe gas, you need to have a carbon price which is high enough that, you know, the full build cost of renewable is competitive with the operating cost of existing plants because you need to decarbonize the power sector. Decarbonizing the power sector is, is the absolutely fundamental and first thing to do before you can actually tackle emissions in, in the rest of the uh, energy system. Mustafa, yeah. Yeah, I would like to add something. Uh, it's going back to the issue of uh, prices, and uh, we are in a buyer's market, and uh, which is likely to uh, continue for a while. But we need to keep in mind that these projects have investors. They have, uh, and so far, you know, for several years, I would say investors have seen reduced return or negative returns. And the question is, how long with this situation would be sustainable for investors? We see a lot of uh, articles about uh, shareholders and investors saying we want uh, uh, the companies to become greener and everything. Yes, everybody agrees with that. There is no doubt that uh, uh, this is, you know, the objective. But on the other hand, you know, this... Uh, an increasing level of frustration among investors and lenders as well, in terms of you know the margins that are being generated or not generated for that purpose by these low prices. So the question is, would there be some kind of adjustment at, at some stage? Uh, so we have to keep that uh, we have to keep that in in, in mind in terms of your. Um, uh, the future outlook. There was a question uh, about uh, GECF. I'm not sure if I got it right, but uh, uh, it states that uh, Russia mentioned that they should have some kind of gas OPEC. I'm not sure that is correct. Uh, at least several of the GECF uh, forum members have made it very clear that that's not the purpose. And it's not only that, but the structure of the gas market is completely different from, from the oil market. So I can't see, you know, this kind of, you know, uh, uh, concept of gas OPEC being developed. Yes, indeed. And I think uh, the issue of returns is, is quite a key one. And this leads me to, uh, to the next questions that we have, the next group of questions that we have on the chat. And I'll group them together because I think uh, the, all these issues around low cost, low carbon producers from the Middle East competing in a, in a shrinking or, or at least a plateauing market share in the future against um, IOCs who are under an increasing pressure uh, from their shareholders and uh, from the investors who are asking them not only to deliver returns, but also dividends on a, on a, on a continu continuous basis. And I think I'll start by clarifying a few things. Uh, among, I think there was one question on the chat on, uh, on particularly the five factors that I mentioned, and I would want to spend a bit more time on that. I mean, if you take, uh, it's true that if you look at the numbers today of how uh, companies like uh, Saudi Aramco, Qatar Petroleum, and other NOCs, other well-positioned NOCs in the region are compared against uh, other, I would say, uh, why, uh, uh, global players, uh, you have uh, a relatively high return on average capital employed, which was not necessarily something that was uh, viewed as being positive uh, by the oil and gas industry as a whole over the last 10 years. Uh, whereas in the region, you have relatively, uh, relatively good capital efficiency. Uh, you are possibly having uh, an optimized supply chain, and that counts a lot when it comes to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the gas sector. When I, I want to spend maybe two minutes on the issue of low carbon. I mean, this comes from uh, a study originally that was commissioned, I think, in 2014, that looked into, uh, in the oil sector, uh, I think now 9,000 fields around the world, and uh, the, the fields where you have uh, a really a concentration of, of low carbon crudes is in the Middle East. Uh, I think Algeria is the only exception. Unfortunately, Mustafa, I'm sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, but uh, I, if, if I remember the study very well, uh, 
Saudi crews and, and other crews from the region were coming very low uh, when, it, when it came to uh, carbon intensity as well. And it's also a coincidence that these are the low cost uh, crews that we have in the, in the world. Uh, on the gas side, I think you have some of the same dynamics if you take uh, a country like Qatar, and I think this was, a, this was a question that was raised also in the chat when we did that little export net back parity calculation. I mean, it's true that uh, we end up in a situation where these, uh, some of these players have access to low cost, low carbon uh, assets uh, by the mere nature that there are national oil companies operating in their country. So if, if, if again, if cost curves start to mean something over the, in a post COVID world, if the market share is plateauing, and I don't want to say shrinking, but at least plateauing, it's true that the competition is going to become fierce. I would not want to comment on the IUCs because uh, we, don't, we don't want to start that debate right now, uh, unless Anne-Sophie has, has something to say on that indeed. But from, from that perspective, I think there are also independents and other players in the sector that will feel the heat of, of, of that shrinking market share that I'm, that I'm, that I'm talking about. And, and it's true that our hypothesis so far is that the ones that are well positioned to weather uh, the, the storm or, 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 uh, or the next four or five years of, of, of squeezed margins and lower returns in, in the oil and gas sector will be, some of them will be in this region. I, I think, I mean, uh, what, what you were talking about is something that we have actually featured in our, in our energy outlook. So, voila. I, not sure. So this is the carbon intensity of different countries. I think Algeria is indeed at the top and Saudi Arabia is at the bottom. So there is a, a ratio roughly roughly of one to three between the different, uh, the, the two different countries. So it illustrates exactly what you have said. And, and I mean, it really depends on how high the carbon price would be uh, in different worlds or different assumptions and how this is going to affect. But more and more, I mean, there will be uh, an, an a focus on, on that and the different good qualities. And of, uh, there are some things which can be done in terms of uh, operations, but at the end of the day, I mean, not everything is equal. On gas, I think there are two things. I mean, there is, uh, first of all, the, 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 the different carbon emissions, but there, is, there are also the methane emissions, and methane emissions have really become one of the key issues uh, for natural gas, and this is something that at BP, you know, we have made commitments in terms of the reducing our methane intensity, but also um, moving forward and proposing things and, and, and looking at reducing um, the methane emissions from uh, our upstream operations. And as I, we mentioned at the, at the beginning, I mean, uh, yesterday's um, European Union has um, really the methane strategy, and they are looking at, of course, what is going on in Europe, but they are also mentioning that they will talk to international players and they are looking at imports because they realize that most of the CO2 emissions which are happening uh, for gas or for oil are also happening outside of Europe when this is produced, when this is transported. So this is becoming a key issue. And Europe is obviously at the forefront in terms of thinking of uh, net zero, but I mean, you know, the rest of the world is, is slowly moving towards that. China has pledged to reach carbon neutrality by 2060. I mean, this is China, which is currently the, the largest carbon emission emitter. So this is very important. So there will be a pressure for companies and countries to look more at that, to do the maximum that they can do in terms of operations, to look at minimizing all these uh, all these things, maybe changing the way, you know, the, the, the gas and the oil are produced. I mean, you know, uh, uh, using uh, maybe electricity, uh, green electricity to, to power some parts of the production sites instead of using, you know, the oil and gas. I mean, there, there might be a lot of things which can be done, but at the end of the day, I mean, there will be this push to minimize the carbon intensity of the different different uh, fuels, whether we are talking about oil or, co or gas. Yes, Mustafa, go ahead. Yes, I totally agree. And that's why I mentioned initially uh, uh, the methane emission of uh, North Africa, specifically Algeria and, and, and other countries. I, I totally agree. But there is something which is sometimes ignored. Uh, when you look at the adverse 
the significant impact uh, of uh, the adverse impact of climate change in uh, regions of the world, we sometimes you forget that the MENA region is one of the regions which is going to suffer the most from this adverse climate change. In fact, it is happening, you know, extreme weather. So the in incentives are going to be, yes, you know, there'll be pressure. And then, as the EU said yesterday, there'll be more pressure on the likes of Algeria to do the right thing. But we shouldn't forget that this region also is going to be struggling. And I think there is should I call it awakening among policy decision makers in the region that this is serious, not only for their export, but also for the local consumption. So I see some, it, it's diverse. It, it, it differs from one uh, uh, part of the MENA to uh, the other, but there is some kind of awakening, there's some kind of uh, uh, people are pu putting more attention to the, this climate change. So we're going to see the impact in terms of export, but also locally, there, is, there are some changes happening and we see it in, in some uh, parts of the, 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 the Arab Gulf. I agree. I mean, in fact, in our new energy outlook, we have tried to include a uh, climate change effect on GDP. And I mean, we have relied on external studies because this is not something that uh, we can do by ourselves and we will not pretend to be, you know, to, to have the expertise to do that. But this is definitely something that we have considered and it does have an effect on GDP at the end of the day. And indeed, I mean, uh, in, the, in the region, in the middle, so which includes the Middle East, Africa, India, and all these countries. So this is something which is not going to be negligible at the end of the day. Yeah, and I, and I think there is a, there is also an, another interesting question in the chat about uh, market share again, uh, the markets, and uh, the fact that maybe the MENA strategies are maybe too focused on one single entity player, which is China, or one single uh, market, which is China. And I think uh, I would love to get your thoughts and Sophie on that. Uh, I mean, we highlighted in our report that uh, China will account for 23% of global LNG demand by 2025, while India will increase imports by 30% to, uh, to 2025. But that also, uh, uh, of course, uh, there, there are huge, huge assumptions around uh, the feasibility of, of LNG imports into India and other major markets, but we, we, we view India as a, as a major growth mar market for LNG. Uh, would you like to take some comments on that, anne -Sophie? I mean, China for me is the largest uncertainty which exists for any commodity. I mean, if China, if you get it wrong by 0.5% per year, it can amount to a huge discrepancy at the end of the day. China is already uh, one of the largest uh, gas market. It's over 300 billion cubic meters. So this is quite substantial. This is three times uh, what Qatar currently exports in terms of LNG. And the problem with China is that if you get it right in terms of gas demand and you need to take into account, you know, the policy, we have all been surprised when, uh, you know, the blue sky policy suddenly triggered a huge industry and, and residential shift from coal to gas in 2017-18 and suddenly we saw LNG imports increasing massively. So there is that demand part. Then you need to take into account what is happening on the domestic production. And I mean, there are different, you know, sources of production from conventional to unconventional, but there is also the desire not to be too dependent. So there is some sort of threshold, you know, are you below or above 50% import dependency? And then there is the interaction between the different sources of supply. I'm not going to talk about Myanmar because this is relatively small, but you have Central Asia, so Turkmenistan mostly. You have Russia, which has started exporting to China last year and is definitely willing to expand its market share there. It's um, power of area is already going to deliver uh, when the, the ramp up is finalized about 30 billion cubic meters uh, of, uh, of gas and, and could be expanded. I mean, another pipeline could, could also um, be built there. And then there is LNG. So, I mean, you need, you need to basically have a view on all these different things in order to understand how LNG can increase. And, and LNG in China has been doing a lot of up and downs. But I mean, for, for, for indeed, 
Right now, LNG has been relatively resilient in China, has continued to increase at the expense, I would say, of pipeline gas. I mean, pipeline gas has been literally stashed. So it's really a question of how competitive it is and how also it has been contracted we have seen a lot of um, uh, NOC, so I mean the three big uh, players in China uh, have contracted uh, LNG, not always at a cheap price, but there is also mounting pressure for a range of small players which are trying to get access also to LNG and they might be looking for different types of indexation. So you have oil index on one side fighting against, you know, JKM or hub-based indexation on the other side. Y you have different strategies and dynamics and this is what is making uh, the gas market particularly complicated to, to understand in China. India, I mean, India has a very clear target to which 15% of a share of gas in the primary energy mix, which is in itself not easy. And there is, I mean, it includes increasing gas demand share in pretty much every sector. And there are some sectors which are pretty straightforward like industry. But the key is really the power generation. If you don't increase gas demand in power generation, then 15% is not going to happen. And we have actually 15% in only one of our scenarios. This is a rapid scenario, and this is supported by a massive shift from coal to gas. But in order for that to happen, you need to have either something happening in terms of policy or a massive switch from, or a massive stabilization. In fact, it's not even a, a switch, you are not decommissioning coal power plants, you need to basically stop them from growing so fast in order for gas to basically have a, sh a role to play to meet additional electricity demand because electricity demand is going to increase in India. I mean, they are starting from solo that it has to increase. It's, 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 and, and renewable will meet a very important part, but not, will not meet everything. Yeah, indeed. I mean, a major market with a lot of pent up demand uh, there, absolutely. Uh, Mustafa, I would like to get back to you on this question that is in the chat. And I was hesitating whether we should organize a webinar just for it, which is about the reforms in the energy sector that are needed. You mentioned that. So can you elaborate a bit on that? What kind of reforms in which countries more than others need these reforms in MENA? I think we will need uh, uh, another webinar just to address the issue of energy reforms in the MENA region. Uh, but uh, if you can just provide some highlights of, of, of what you think is still needed as far as uh, reforms are concerned. Ah, I think we lost Mustafa for a moment. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm back. I don't know what happened. Sorry, what was the question? So uh, the question was referring to your statement when you said that uh, reforms in the energy sector are needed. Uh, the, the, Laurie wants you to elaborate on that. What kind of reforms and which countries more than others need these reforms in the MENA region? And I, and I understand that you, you, we can talk about this for hours and I yeah. also have my personal views, but if you can just give us some very quick highlights of what would be the most important reforms to finish, by the way, or, or, or push forward. In, in, uh, uh, yes. Uh... I'm referring, I was referring mainly to the energy price reform, not only gas price reform. And in all fairness, that has started already in several uh, MENA countries. Uh, the difficult uh, situation is how to deal with the gas to power issue. Because when you look at gas to power, 50% or even more of uh, that consumption is going to, uh, to a household, uh, residential sector, and in some uh, uh, other parts of MENA, like in Algeria, you have the gasification where uh, there's a high level of gas use in the household. So that's where the, the problem is going to happen. But I believe that in the industrial sector, we will see uh, reform going faster than for the rest of, uh, of the other sectors. Um, we have heard a lot about energy efficiency. You know, this is one, a recurrent theme that we hear. Uh, from different MENA region, MENA countries. But the issue is if you don't reform prices, domestic energy prices, uh, energy efficiency is not going to happen. You know, you can change equipment, you can force people to have different equipment, uh, you can uh, come up with uh, building regulation, but at the end of the day is the domestic energy price. And that's, to me, one of the major uh, drivers. 
So it is about domestic energy price reform, continuing or initiating them or because it, it, some countries, they have been talking about it, making announcements, politicians have been making announcements, but there haven't been any implementation. So it's about implementation or further implementation of these reforms. Right, I, I want to tackle uh, two questions in one row that are in the chat uh, related to, uh, I would say, the role of renewables and whether we see uh, more, uh, more hydrogen being uh, produced in the region. Uh, in the question, the, 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 there is a specific question about blue hydrogen, and I assume that's because of Aramco's announcements uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, but also ammonia uh, for, in that regard. And I think from, from that perspective, it, it is something that we should include in next year's outlook, because in addition to, uh, I would say, the, 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 the suspects where you have, again, a concentration of of uh, low cost uh, gas or low cost uh, hydrocarbons, you also have a, a concentration now of low cost renewables in, um, in the GCC, but also in, in countries like Morocco who have um, the regulatory framework in place to uh, enable, uh, to have enabled a massive development of renewables. And the plan there is definitely to, to try and capture some of that market share when it comes to uh, future hydrogen uh, ammonia, uh, etc. So, and the, the proximity to Europe is definitely tempting to have this sort of plans in, in, in the future. Um, so, I think from our perspective, we will definitely have that included uh, with some cost figures and again, com competitiveness uh, between the different players in the region. Uh, but in next year's outlook, but I would, uh, I would turn to Anne Sophie and Mustafa to see if they have any thoughts on. Uh, on hydrogen and ammonia based on renewables indeed. Yeah, I mean, uh, we do see a role for hydrogen, particularly if we are moving to a low carbon energy system. I mean, and, and the role of hydrogen can be in different parts. I mean, it can be in industry, in hardware sectors like steel, like cement, some pet chems. Uh, it can also be um, in transport, uh, in particular in the marine or in trucks where there is, I mean, it's very difficult to decarbonize. I mean, trucks, you've, electrifying trucks doesn't really work. Uh, it can also be implemented in, in buildings um, in order to meet, uh, the, 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 especially when you have cold weather, you know, the, the additional requirement uh, that electrification would not be able to meet or would be able to meet at a very high cost. So, so we do see a growing role for hydrogen. And I mean, people would have to appreciate that uh, we are at the, at the very beginning of, of an increasing curve and there are still a lot of uncertainties on where exactly hydrogen could be implemented, which region, how high the demand would be. But when we looked at that, I mean, we thought that at the end of the day, there would be a mix of blue hydrogen and green hydrogen, which would depend on local circumstances, on the competitiveness, the availability of renewable as well. I think renewable are best used first to decarbonize the power system. And then if there is some additional left, and there, we, there was a very good report from one of your colleagues, Mustafa from OIS, on looking specifically at Germany, if there is some additional capacity left, I mean, to produce additional uh, green hydrogen. Of course, uh, in the MENA region, there is abundance of, um, of, uh, of potential for, for solar and wind. So, I mean, that's something that can be used. For me, as an engineer, one of the critical aspects is how to transport the hydrogen. And, and this is for the moment still extremely uncertain, a little bit in terms of the technology, in particular when we are looking at liquefied hydrogen, but also uh, in terms of the cost. How much is it going to cost? Because, you know, as much as oil in terms of, you know, cost of transporting oil across the world is very small compared to the final price. For gas, you start, you know, to have things which are pretty high, I mean, in the order of almost two dollars from the US to Asia, for example. But for hydrogen, we don't know exactly how much this is going to be yet. And I marvel at people who can give me a price for or cost for 2050 at two decimal point. Uh, this is wonderful. Uh, I mean, please give me 
give me something which is probably a bit more realistic. And there is indeed the question, what is going to be the best thing? I mean, we have looked mostly at, at hydrogen. I have to say that, you know, there are a lot of people and countries which are also looking at ammonia and co-firing with ammonia. I mean, at the end of the day, it's as much a cost as also a technology question. I mean, how do you move from one to the other? Uh, I mean, there are some issues with hydrogen. There are also some issues with ammonia, including its toxicity. And 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 if you, can, you can't use ammonia for everything, you might be able to to do some co-firing, but I mean, you would not be using that to, for example, I think, uh, for heating of buildings. So there might be some limitations. I, I have to say that it requires a lot of studies from the international community to better understand what the hydrogen or ammonia world will look like in the future. Uh, All right. And, and nothing much to add. Just one point, you know, we've been hearing uh, a lot um, about uh, hydrogen being imported from the MENA region, since we're talking about MENA region. Again, another area of intrigue, you know. I mean, when we talk about imports from the MENA region, are these developers or these project developers uh, willing to invest? I mean, do they have the financial muscle to invest in those MENA countries? to produce the hydrogen, to transport it, uh, and Sophie mentioned the cost. I think these are all the issues that have not been sorted out. We keep seeing very nice glossy uh, PowerPoint presentation about, you know, uh, hydrogen, whether it's H2 uh, hydrogen or uh, ammonia being uh, imported, but, you know, how about, you know, the investment that would be required to invest in those MENA region uh, countries, uh, the transfer of technology that will be required, technology which could be very advanced. So I think this is an area also that needs to be looked at and, uh, and, and go beyond, you know, just, you know, uh, statements. That's all. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, indeed, and that's why we'll, we'll do it next year. <laughs> we'll, we'll focus on it next year. A uh, very interesting question, uh, based on how we have experienced in 2020 so far, is the industry now more risk resilient in weathering the next unprecedented storm, survive and remain relevant? My, my personal opinion, Shamsul, is I think the industry came now, uh, survived or survived in a way, uh, two consecutive downturns. Now we are in the third one. You have the 2008-2009 crisis. You have the 2014-2016 crisis. And now we came to 2020, uh, where there were already some efficiencies embedded in the system, a lot of costs being uh, reduced. Uh, again, I get back to the issue of capital efficiency that has improved uh, in the sector all in all, uh, and a drive for integration that uh, enables uh, players to, uh, to to try at least to win some races if they cannot win all the races. So my personal perspective is that the, en the energy industry as a whole, including, of course, uh, the renewables and utilities part of the sector, and we have some champions here uh, in this region that have uh, exported their capabilities uh, to other markets and have pushed for uh, the declining cost of renewables that we've seen uh, worldwide. Um, I think, indeed, the energy industry is bit more resilient because it's more flexible and, and increasingly integrated. But uh, I'll leave it to my, uh, to my uh, colleagues and panelists to, uh, to give their own opinion on this question. Thanks, Sophie. Well, I do very much hope that we are, I mean, resilient. And, uh, and obviously, I mean, this has been a particularly challenging year. I mean, uh, we, we got at BP a, a new CEO, a new strategy, <laughs> and the COVID at the same time. So as you can imagine, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, having a new CEO is a crisis, but, you know, it was a combination of a lot of changes. And I, and I think, I mean, the way we look at it is that we have to be prepared for the future uncertainty. So we are positioning ourselves to be able to thrive in a difficult environment and looking at the different developments. And you know, we, we, we are obviously still staying in oil and gas, which has been you know, our main area of expertise, but we are also uh, developing in, in renewable with the target of 50 gigawatt of investments. We are also looking at hydrogen. We are looking at bioenergy. So we are looking at all these things that we have been talking about today in order to be able to address, I hope, 
all the uncertainties. I mean, it's obviously, you know, very challenging to say that I don't think anybody had ever anticipated something like the COVID crisis. Yeah, I mean, our business is about, I mean, sorry, the energy business is about managing risks. Uh, I mean, sometimes, you know, I wonder uh, uh, when people come up with feasibility study with that IRR at, at two, three, four digits. Yes, that's fine. I mean, it's about scenarios. It's about how we're going to mitigate the different risks that are going to pop up to emerge. I would like to add something since we're talking about energy. Again, it's not a uniform uh, thing. When we're talking about oil and gas, more specifically upstream oil and gas, the returns are of different magnitude and order than renewable, which is utility. So you have to reconcile the fact that if you're talking about oil and gas upstream, you're talking possibly double digit returns. Renewable, it's a utility business, could be single digit or no digits at all. So these things have to be reconciled. And uh, don't forget at the end of the day, you need investors to fund this project to make them happen. Thank you very much, Mustafa and Asofi. I mean, the, the double digit returns, some players, especially in the renewable sector, will tell you it's a matter of the past. It's not the case anymore. Yeah, and they, they are providing better returns than, than some oil and gas developments in, in, in the world. So, but I, I, I'll leave it there. I don't want to open another debate on the returns of, 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 uh, of different fuels and technologies. I think uh, this has been a, a great discussion. I would like to, to thank you uh, and Sophie and Mustafa for, uh, for first reviewing the report and agreeing to, uh, to share this, uh, your insights with us during this webinar. Um, uh, there are still many questions on the chat. Most of them are related to specific projects, uh, either SOAR or COTC in Saudi Arabia or Amiral. So what I suggest is that you, you contact us, you send us an email and we will definitely send you the specifics on those projects because we tend not to comment on specific projects uh, that, that, that we highlight in our report for, for obvious reasons. Um, we will make the slides available on, uh, on our website. We'll also make the recording available as it was uh, requested by, uh, by several participants. And uh, I would like to now uh, wish you a safe and productive end of the week and uh, stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.